Good morning, church. We're so glad you're with us. Hey, will you stand as we worship together? How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? Take your seats. This is Salem Heights today. Guys, you won't want to miss men's Bible study this summer. They will be studying in Colossians about the supremacy of Christ and we'll meet Sundays at 7 a.m. starting July 17th. Visit the booth next week to sign up and get more information about men's events. Our Crossroad Ministry for Young Adults has several fun summer events planned. Message us to get notified of upcoming events. Mark your calendars. Join us for an exciting day at Foster Lake on August 20th. This is a church-wide event to build connection and fellowship as we get ready to start a new ministry year. More details coming soon. Starting next week, we will have a newcomer's welcome event outside in the South parking lot. If you're new to Salem Heights, stop by the welcome tent to meet our staff and receive a gift. If you're new with us today, we are so excited that you're here. 
We would love to connect with you and answer any questions you may have. You can fill out or scan the visitor card in the seat pocket in front of you to let us know you were here today. Have a great week. Well, who here is excited that the sun is finally out, right? And how many of you in the room are thankful that you're in an air-conditioned room right now? Yes, <laughs> it's getting hot out there. Well, we're going to sing, uh, basically, we're going to sing the exact words from Psalm 23 this morning. And part of that psalm says, Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. Now, I think sometimes when we encounter a trial or we encounter a hardship in our lives, it's easy to allow it to come and kind of cloud our vision. And sometimes we can find ourselves looking to, looking to God and saying, okay, Lord, I know that you're in control of all things. I know that you're faithful, but I'm having a hard time believing in your goodness right now, right? Well, the good news is, is that scripture talks a ton about the goodness of God. Earlier in the Psalm, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. Do you know that he knows your needs better than you know your own needs? Sometimes we can, we can pray to him and say, Lord, this is exactly what I need. I know what I need. And now your job is just to give it to me, right? But he knows perfectly. He sees into the depths of your heart. And he can, it says scripture pierces the division in your heart. And he can give you exactly what you need. Even in good seasons, it's important to remember the goodness of the Lord. And so we're going to sing about that now. Will you join me?
thankful for his goodness this morning.
riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever. We're going to sing a great old hymn together declaring his faithfulness to us.
pray with me? Father, we thank you for your great faithfulness, Lord. When we were far away from you, when we were dead in our sins, Lord, you had mercy and compassion. Your goodness was extended towards us, Father. And now, when, now that we are in your love and we are secure, Father, I pray that we would not get distracted by, by trials and hardships that may come into our life, Lord, but that we would take them and that we would run to you, Father, knowing that your goodness remains, your love and your mercy, Father. When we were far from you, it abounded, Lord, and, and now that we are with you, it abounds even more. Lord, so I pray that we would trust you, that we would offer our hearts and our minds to you, Father, and that you would search them, that you would cut out all of the parts that, that don't belong to you, Father, and that you would craft us more into your image. Father, you love us enough to do that, and we thank you so much that we get to sing these words of praise to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we hear from your word now. In your name I pray, amen. You guys can take your seats. Well, good morning, folks. Aren't you glad to be in church this morning? Yeah. How many of you, this is your only form of AC that you're going to have today or in Oregon? All right, just a few of you. All right, thanks for being here. We're, uh, we're in the middle of a series that we've been, uh, we started a couple weeks ago. We've been focusing on, we're going to focus on for the entire summer called God's Heart, Our City. And last week we covered a verse out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just want to remind you of this, and it helps us as we enter into this morning. Uh, Paul says this, this is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. Uh, we believe that there is a God who has given us a, a game plan for our life, and it's not just our emotions, right? It's not just whatever we want to do. It's not based on whatever somebody else tells us to do. It is God's word, his plan, and he can govern your life and help you make sense of a mess. Amen? Amen? Yeah? Okay, yeah. I thought uh, maybe everyone fell asleep there for a moment. All right. We're, we uh, we promised you at the beginning of the series, though, uh, we would kick this off. We're going to talk about uh, God's Word, but we're also bringing in some folks with brains, okay? And so this morning, I want to introduce you to somebody who, in fact, has the credentials. He's qualified as somebody with brains. Jeremiah Johnson, come on up here. Let's give him a hand as he comes up here. Uh, I was so blessed, first service, uh, to Thank be you. able to hear Thanks, the God. message that uh, God's laid on your heart. But would you just share for the sake of these folks a quick bio yes. uh, about your family and just how you came to be here? Absolutely. First of all, praise God, I brought the sunshine from Texas with me and the heat. So be careful what you ask for, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am from Texas where God has a second home, of course, and it's just a blessing to be ministering here in Oregon again, I've been before. This is my first time preaching in Salem. I've preached a couple of times in Portland. The only bio you need to know about me though, Pastor, I mentioned this, I am the overstressed father of multiple children. So let me just show you this picture if I may. Be careful what you pray for when you have an unanswered. I have a whole book series called Unanswered because I had my own unanswered questions. That's why I love yeah. this series on unanswered questions that y'all are doing this summer. Um, we couldn't get pregnant, church family. So be careful what you pray for when you have an unanswered question for God. Buckle your seatbelt. Lily, she's actually here with me in this service. She's my traveling companion. She turns 13 and four days. Is that right, honey? And then uh, Abel, Ryder, and Jackson are triplets. And then my favorite name, Justin, our son, who is 10. So um, we have been changing 700 diapers a month. So pray for me. I'm still recovering from this. It, literally, I, I thought I was speaking a heavenly language when they were potty trained, ladies and gentlemen. It was that important to me. Not good to be on the first name basis with the diaper people at Costco. I think they gold-plated my name there. I'm not even kidding. So um, they are my first ministry. I take it really seriously. I have a wife, um, Audrey, we met at summer youth camp 20 or so years, a little more than 20 years ago now. 
Uh, we're co-called to ministry, and she's praying for your church. She's praying for me as I minister the word to you, and uh, her faithfulness allows me to leave and go do what God's gifted me to do. So pray for Audrey, too, if you don't mind. She is a master of divinity and just loves the people of God. So it's a blessing to be here, and I uh, look forward to meeting as many of you as I can after the service. Yeah, I think uh, when you were telling me about how many diapers, I'm changing that many diapers will put you in diapers. That's so, right. Yeah, it'll, uh, That's exactly it'll be a problem right. for you long term. They don't give you a manual for triplets no. at the hospital. They triplets. don't give you any any idea about this. So. And yeah, sometime you'll have to tell us a story because there's some pretty cool things yeah. that had happened along the way for you to have mm-hmm. all three in your arms. What That's cool right. Thing. Uh, at the end of, uh, I just forgot the the second the book that we were talking about. Um, unimaginable. Yeah, so. unimaginable. At the very yeah. end of that. There is a story uh, mm-hmm. about a couple uh, that you met while you were right. down in California, and I would like to just set up what you're about to preach Thank on you. with that story. Okay, so I love seeing the evidence of the Christian faith, that if everything that we say is true about Christianity, there should be fallout all over the world, and it should make an actual difference Uh, in our lives. And I think that the church is the greatest force for good on planet earth. The evidence leads me to believe that the power of gospel doesn't just transform our lives, it transforms communities and countries. And we can study the countries that have turned their back on God. More than one half of the world's population in the last 70 years live in areas that have turned their back on God. We can study those countries. Maybe I can come back and do a weekend on this or a a message at some point because we we don't have to imagine it. They're terrible places to live. It's easier to kill people, enslave people, inequality, law of the jungle, dehumanizing humanity. And so what's really exciting, though, is when we study the impact, and I don't worship Christianity, I worship Jesus Christ, but when our faith is lived out faithfully, it makes a massive difference. So very quickly, uh, in my personal research, I met a sweet family down at Twin Lakes Church in Santa Cruz, California, Dan and Lynn Wagner. Listen to this closely. They were serving the Lord faithfully at a Luis Palau evangelistic beach rally two weeks after 9-11. She showed me a painting of her two daughters, their teenagers, Carrie and Mandy, age 16 and age 14, Pastor Justin. And they were altar workers, so excited to get home from what the Lord had done, buckled their seatbelt in the minivan, never made it home. Uh, Because a woman who was both drunk and also high on meth plowed her Suburban into the Wagner family minivan, and instantly both daughters were killed. Um, the, it was amazing that Dan and Lynn even survived the automobile accident. Dan was concussed, and the cryptic part when I was interviewing him, he said that he had to be told again and again because of the short-term amnesia that his daughters had both been killed over and over again. Lynn, faithful Lynn, amazing woman, <laughs> She said, Jeremiah, when I finally woke up a few days after the accident, broken pelvis, all kinds of problems, she said, are my girls with the Lord? First thing out of her mouth, her friend confirmed, she said, praise the Lord. Now, having said that, they blew up Christmas that year. It took a long time to come back from that. They said, Dan and Lynn said, we would not have survived without our church. They said it took time. They made that very clear. It wasn't an overnight fix. But through awesome Christian counseling, the fellowship of the church and the preaching of the word of Pastor Renee, what's amazing, God began to heal their heart. They'll never be the same like they were before, but God began to bring healing and God spoke to them. They needed to forgive Lisa, the driver of the automobile who had gone to prison. Lisa had come to faith in Christ. And when she was getting released seven years or so later, Dan and Lynn Wagner asked to meet her with their parole officer. They walk up to Lisa. This is the first time they've been in the same room with the person driving the vehicle who killed their daughters. By the way, parenthetical note, this is where faith makes a difference in the world. Dan and Lynn walk up to Lisa and they say, through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, Lisa, we love you. And through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, we forgive you. We'd like to ask you, would you like to be our daughter? Lisa, Dan, and Lynn Wagner now travel around to libraries and any place that will give them an audience, and they talk about the power of forgiveness in Jesus' name. Isn't that crazy? Only through faith can Jesus make that kind of difference in our life, where he turns the most tragic, terrible things, showing us that he's in control and he's still faithful. Yeah, and the parole officer, the the guard, they they were so concerned about it. Oh, yes, I forgot. Yeah, the judge was like, we've never had this request. Is this going to be an act of violence? They had an armed guard in the room. 
Uh, and, you know, these kind of stories is the blessing of me working with churches like Salem Heights because we get to see it in a very real ways in which even in your pastor's dynamic story, faith isn't just a cerebral thing. It is. We don't bra- check our brain at the door, but the Christian faith meets us at our greatest points of need, and it gets us through all the catastrophes of life. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, great question. That. It's the kind of God we want to follow. Amen. It does stories like that. So Amen. I'm going to pray, and then Thank you, you tell Pastor. us more about him. So, Thank you, Pastor. Father, we uh, just come before you right now, and I pray that uh, you'd give Jeremiah the clarity right now, the, uh, the ability to yes, re-preach Father. those things that you've laid on his heart, give him strength. But also, Father, we pray that you would be magnified, that stories like that, stories that only you could put together, You're the one that transforms lives. You're the one that uses the word and impacts others. Uh, You're the one who we testify about. And so I pray that you would get glory as he preaches. Give him strength. Give us the ability to follow through with what you lay on our hearts, yes, we Lord. pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. It's such a delight to be here. I've been asked thousands of questions from believers, and the number one question that I have been asked from Christians in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, from denomina- all across the denominational spectrum, is this question related to a lack of the peace of God in our life anxiety, panic attacks, depression, suicidal ideation. These are the questions that people are searching for today in Salem. And I'm delighted to be preaching this morning on the peace of God in the city of Salem. Think about that. Do you know what Salem means? Salemites or whatever we call ourselves here. Uh, It means peace. Jerusalem, Salem. It's a cognitive peace. And one thing that I love about the Christian faith, and I'm so thankful for your pastor and the vision for this series, is that Jesus Christ didn't flinch when he was asked questions, ladies and gentlemen. He never flinched. You could bring any question to Jesus, and he wasn't offended by it. And you know what? In fact, he used those questions to engage in a faith conversation. In fact, we only have about 22 or so parts. We have only 22 days or so, not 24-hour periods, just parts of 22 days in the life of Jesus. And when you study those 22 days that are recorded and embedded in the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the book of Acts, do you know what's fascinating? Jesus asks 322 questions in those 22 or so days. Jesus loved asking questions. There are 3,200 questions in the scriptures. Did you know that? And by the way, I'm fascinated by the fact that there's two promises from God for every, Christ, for every question in the Bible, 7,487 promises in God's word to meet those 3,200 questions in the scripture. Don't ever let someone tell you you can't question your faith. If everything we believe about the Christian faith is true, and it is, God can take, guess what, he's a big boy, He can take our deepest, darkest questions, and God can use those questions to bring transformation to our life. And yet, I have met many believers in my time doing ministry now for two decades. They've allowed a question to paralyze them spiritually. Have you ever had a question paralyze you spiritually? I have. Where literally you stop. The question is not something you ever thought you would deal with in your life, and you have spiritual paralysis because of that. I'm praying that as a result of not only today, but the last two weeks in the summer series, God will bring you freedom in whatever those deep questions are. But you need to hear this. We have a faith where Jesus said we're to love him with our heart, soul, and our what? Say it out loud, mind. Jesus is asked, what's the greatest command by the nomikos and the grammatus, the scribes, the experts in the law? Jesus responds by quoting the Shema. Uh, Faithful Jews quoted it twice a day. Jesus does something really cool with Deuteronomy 6. He does something only the Messiah can do. He messianizes the passage, and he literally changes the wording, and he says, the Shema Hebrew Bible, love God with your heart, soul, and strength. Jesus adds, love God with your mind. Are you willing to be a Christian thinker? Are you willing to say yes, Lord, to the great commandment? And that means it's not a Sunday morning faith. It's a faith that will meet us in our difficult questions. And then we'll see the power of the gospel is the Bible will answer those questions that we face. Number one question I've been asked is from believers who have struggled with the lack of the peace of God. And I'm going to encourage you to go to your Bibles in Philippians chapter 4. is going to be our base text. I'm going to be sharing some other important passages with you. But I want to, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine because he was ministering uh, in the city of Troas. 
And what's fascinating is even though God was blessing his ministry, people were coming to faith in Christ, numerous people were coming to faith in Christ, he had a great door open to him. <coughs> but have you ever been in this place where God's using you perhaps, um, but at the same time you don't have any peace from God? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, of course I'm talking about St. Paul, the Apostle Paul has a panic attack. Jeremiah, you mean Paul had a panic attack? I think so. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul is in Troas. He says, God is opening doors. And he said, he struck out. Why? I had no peace of mind. You know what I find remarkable about that? Sweetheart, can you grab me a, a water and just bring that up here to me? I've got a little tickle in my throat. Excuse me, y'all. Thank you so much. Give Lily a round of applause for helping daddy. <laughs> You know, what's fascinating about the Apostle Paul as I've studied his life. The Apostle Paul, we, can, we know for sure, had four experiences of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, we could go through all of these. In fact, when St. Paul experiences the Lord in 2 Corinthians 12, he doesn't even tell us what he saw. He tells us what he heard, if you remember. He was caught up to the third heaven and he heard inexpressible utterances. It's powerful to me. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Um, fascinating, he sees the Lord for, we can speculate, this, I hate this when this happens. Have you ever been in a meeting and like you get a tickle and you're, just bear with me for a moment. You all can edit this out. I'm a real human being, not a robot. So feel free to do that. Um, Paul has at least seven experiences with Jesus Christ. And I find, I mean, I want to ask you a question. If you had like seen the Lord this week, I'm talking about seeing him because in 2 Corinthians 12, Jesus speaks to Paul in oracular form. That's what we call it in exegesis. That doesn't mean that like he was reading the Hebrew Bible and God spoke to his heart. I mean, the force of the Greek is he heard the voice of Jesus in 2 Corinthians 12 say, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. I want to ask you a question. If you had heard the voice of Jesus, would you worry about anything? And yet Paul saw the Lord, heard the voice of Jesus, saw Jesus seven times, and Paul was still a professional warrior, ladies and gentlemen. Did you know that? We know that because you can trace the time in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 13, I had no peace of mind. Many of people who we're praying for to reach in Salem are right where Paul was in 2 Corinthians 2 13. God's opened up great doors for you. God's blessing you. And yet you have no peace of mind. And maybe only God is the one who knows that about you. Let me show you what Paul did. Paul did something in seven years, and it took time. Listen, we come to faith in Christ in a moment, and we're forgiven. That peace doesn't change. But peace, the peace, the shalom of God is a, is a that transformation, that is a process in our life. And that is something that we have to work at and focus on every single day. Fast forward seven years later, Paul's in prison. He's writing this magisterial epistle of Philippians. He gives us the greatest anti-anxiety passage in all the Bible, Philippians 4. Of course, you know that, verse 6. He tells us we're to rid our minds of certain things in verse 6. Verse 8, we're to fill our minds with certain things. And then he gives us this promise that, ladies and gentlemen, if it wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it was possible. He says, verse 6, don't worry about anything. I feel like that's impossible, don't you? And yet the scriptures tell us, and that's a command, don't worry about anything, pray about everything, tell God your needs, don't forget to thank him. And then what's the promise in verse seven? And the shalom of God, the peace of God will garrison your hearts and your minds. It's a peace that passes all understanding. Verse eight, then Paul gives us in verse eight, are you ready for this? his personal peace plan. Paul gives us, and depending on what translation you have, it's 32 English words, six adjectives, two nouns, one verb, and 32 words, legizomai, focus, think about these things. And here's what's remarkable to me. I want you to give yourself the grace that God wants to give you today. Do you know how long Paul had been following Jesus when he wrote Philippians 4? 30 years. It took him a minute to get there. If you're a professional warrior like Paul or like me, you're in good company. Paul didn't stay there. 
He didn't allow that worry to paralyze him. He got a plan in his life. And so I've written a book called Unleashing Peace because I wanted to investigate what does it look like to experience the shalom of God? Do you know many people think the word shalom is just a greeting? It's translated 70 different ways in the NIV Bible alone. The word shalom shows up 550 times in scripture. In fact, I would use the word shalom to describe the, the entirety of the Bible. I could describe 760,000 English words with one word. It's a Hebrew word, shalom. Jesus Christ came to first give us peace with God, shalom with God, and then he came to bless us with the peace of God. So many Christians, they stop at peace with God and then we're not experienced. We have peace with God, but we're not experiencing the peace of God. I think of what C.S. Lewis said. Have you read Problem of Pain lately? It was Lewis who said that mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain. This is Lewis, a Christian thinker. He said, but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. Lewis goes on to say, it's easier to say my tooth is aching than my heart is breaking. Lewis had to get a peace plan in his life. Have you seen Shadowlands? Paul had to get a peace plan in his life. So I want to ask you, you probably have a financial plan, a retirement plan, an educational plan, a business plan. Why don't you have a peace plan for your life? A peace of God shalom plan. That's what I've come from Texas to share with you. There is a plan that we can put in place that guarantees we will begin to experience the peace of God. I wanna give you this outline. I'm gonna go quickly. <coughs> it's an outline that I pray you're gonna use again and again. I pray that you will take this biblical outline on the shalom of God and teach it to others. I really, I really pray that with all my heart. How do we define the word shalom? First, let's say it out loud, shalom. One more time, a little louder, I couldn't hear you. Shalom. How do we describe this word? I'm not talking about the Greek word irene. You might have met an Irene. That's based on the Greek word irene. Uh, that concept is simply an absence of conflict or an absence of war. And that word shows up about 90 or so times in the New Testament. And you know what? It really defines a lot of Christians. You know what? You're not at war right now, but you're just living in a truce. You're not living in the peace of God. <laughs> you're living in a truce. That's where I love shalom. Shalom is this promise from God that in spite of all the adversity going around us in the world, and there is a lot, leaders define reality, I can still live in this shalom of God. And here are some terms that I use to describe it. To lack nothing. To be made whole. Completeness. I love this. Lack nothing to flourish. That's the promise of shalom for you and me for our families. God doesn't want us to live in a perpetual state of anxiety. And I wanna share something with you on the power of scripture. Anxiety is not dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. It's a fact of life and it is not dangerous. Jesus Christ's power within us can cause us to overcome any anxiety we face. That is the promise of Philippians 4. I'm to rid my mind of certain things, Philippians 4, 6. Command, don't worry about it. Philippians 4, 7, I'm going to live in the peace of God. It's going to control my life. And then verse 8, I'm going to keep working at it every day. I'm going to live in discipline. I'm going to keep focusing on certain things, fill my mind with things. So how do we live in the peace of God? I love Stott's comment, that great thinker from the UK. He said, the battle for the Christian life is the battle for the Christian mind. How are you doing in your thinking? As you're approaching this series, and as we're in the midst of it, our God's heart, our city for Salem, do you know that Oregon is one of the most difficult places to live if you have a mental challenge? Did you know that? And by that, I mean mental illness, anxiety, depression, whatever you want to call it. By the way, the United States is one of the worst countries to live in, uh, residentially speaking, if we're having a mental breakdown. Do you know that individuals who are experiencing a mental crisis, unfortunately, in our country today, usually end up in one of two places, the ER or jail? And yet the statistics will show us, the research shows us that when someone is in a point of catastrophe or mental crisis, do you know their first phone call, are you ready for this? Is to a pastor, a Christian leader. That's their first call. And so I, I, I became inspired 
as someone who's studied the Gospels carefully, and that's what I do in, in, in a professional level as a scholar, Christians have not studied, it's been underdeveloped, this theology of living in shalom. And so I wanted to teach that to individuals. And I, as I began to see it again and again, we see that the peace of God is a discipline, ladies and gentlemen. So I, come on a journey with me for these next few minutes. Let me give you the outline that God used to change my life writing this book. Did you know writing this book utterly changed my life? I mean, my life, I understand. I, it is very important. I understand anxiety. I have five kids and triplets, okay? I, I work eight days a week. I get it. I totally understand. I can relate to what you're going through. And yet, the scriptures give us a plan to live in his peace. I want to give you that plan. Number one, to live in the peace of God. This is so important. And it's, it's simple. And by the way, sophisticated things can be simple. I want to encourage you with that. Sophisticated things in our life can be simple. That's what makes them so sophisticated. Number one, the peace of God, shalom happens when I have a plan for it. No plan for peace, you're not gonna have it. As I just mentioned, when we look at the individuals in scriptures who had anxiety attacks, who struggled with panic, we see that the only remedy was trusting the truth of God's word and then living in that discipline of peace every day. Number two, shalom is always connected to Jesus Christ. I wanna make sure you don't miss this. I have the opportunity to speak, as I mentioned, to Christians from across the denominational spectrum, and I meet a lot of religious people who are missing the peace of God. Do you know why? They miss Jesus. Do you know it's possible as a religious person to miss Jesus? We see this pop up all the time. In Luke chapter 19, verses 21 and 22, it's Jesus' triumphal entry. The irony of the passage, don't, don't miss the irony of it, Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, kind of like Salem, the city of peace. He begins to weep. The force of the Greek in Luke 19, 41 and 42, Jesus is sobbing. And he says, as he looks out on Jerusalem, if you, even you, had known what would bring you peace, and yet it's hidden from your eyes. Make no mistake, in Luke 19, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. He's speaking to the religious people who missed the shalom of God because they missed Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question. Has there been a moment in your life when you, have made, when you have placed your trust in Jesus and experienced the peace of God? That is the promise of Romans 5.1. And so listen to me closely. There is a divine order to God's peace. And religious people miss this. And I want to help you not to. First and foremost, I'm not going to experience the peace of God until, until I've made peace with God. I can't, experience, I can't do that on my own. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, I love this passage. Therefore, having been justified by faith, not by my religion, not by my good works, having been justified by faith, I have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And do you know... What's powerful about that passage is that's step one. So there's a divine order to the peace of God in my life. And first, we experience peace with God. Then once you've made that decision, and by the way, that peace doesn't change. That's the faithfulness of Jesus. That peace doesn't increase or decrease. You are born again, saved, forgiven in that moment. And yet, once we experience peace with God, our opportunity now, like the Apostle Paul, this is my opportunity now to experience the peace of God. Do you see the divine order of God's peace? First, peace with God. Secondly, the peace of God. And it's Jesus' purpose that we have peace. This is the position that we have to claim, peace with God. We can claim that for ourselves according to the truth of God's, of God's word. So number three, living in God's peace is a discipline. Now, this is fascinating to me. Um, people want to do this quickly. They want it instantaneously. And I joke a lot. I wish that, you know, I could sit, hit you with peace water balloons today. We all need that, okay? I, I wish I could do it for you, but I can't. You have to own this part of your faith. And so as I studied the Apostle Paul, he got a peace plan. I already told you what it was. Elijah got a peace plan. Uh, Gideon got a peace plan. I could go right through the people in scriptures that made certain decisions. And your peace plan might look different than mine. That's the priesthood of the believer. The Holy Spirit will lead you in that peace plan. Mine was really practical. We can geek out on Greek words together. I love doing that. But you know what? I need the practicality of God's word meeting me at my greatest points of need. And you know what? This is my peace plan. And I actually preached this recently in Austin. 
Number one, Jeremiah will not experience the daily peace of God unless he stops obsessively checking the news. Did you know that? One of the greatest things that you can do if you wanna have peace this week on this beautiful Lord's Day, do a news fast, and you'll thank me later for that, okay? Number two, very crucial, check your sources. Try not to contribute to the panic. You know, I have a part of my message that, did you know um, panic is as contagious as any other pathogen? Did you know that? And it has similar results. Panic can kill you. Stress can kill you. And so we have to be so careful that we check our sources. Stop doom scrolling. That's a great thing to do, isn't it? And you know what doom scrolling is? You can never come to the end of these social media feeds, reading other people's highlight reels. It's not good. In fact, they know it's toxic for your brain. So I want to encourage you, you've got to put these peace plans in place. I can't go through all 20 of them, um, but I want to just tell you I had the best time. I went to with Lily and Pastor Pete and Holly. We met some friends. We went to Lincoln City. I put my toes in the freezing Northwest Pacific waters. It was like almost a baptism for me. It woke me up. It jolted me. It was a blessing. Get into nature. You know, and one that's really been ministering to me is number 11. Look at art more. You know, all truth is God's truth. When we see beauty, that's a reflection of the beauty of God. I need to get out in nature more. These are great points that I want to encourage you. This is my peace plan. I'm not pushing it on you. Listen, make your own peace plan. That's what success looks like from today. Number one, I realize it's God's will for me to live in peace. Yes, you. Those of you who are anxiety or depression, that doesn't define you. You are defined by how God sees you. You are a child of righteousness in Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. You are loved perfectly. I love John chapter 13, verse 1. You know what's fascinating is you all love me because you don't know me that well. Did you know that? Did you notice how the more people know us, the the, the smaller the circle gets that people love us? John 13, 1. Having loved them, he loved them to the end. Jesus knows everything about you, and he still loves you perfectly. I wish I was capable of that love. I'm not. Thank God Jesus is. He knows everything about us, John 13, 1, and he loves us to the end perfectly. I've got to work at the peace, though. You mean, you mean Jeremiah, the pastor, can't do this for me? No, I need, to take, I need to take responsibility for my family. You know, there's some priorities that come into play. You know, I love sports. Am I going to let sports govern my life? I love my kids being athletic. Am I going to let sports take them out of church for half the year? I have to make these decisions when I need God's peace, and then I wonder why I don't have it when I look at my priorities or if I'm binging on social media or shows. We'll touch our phones 2,000 times today. Did you know that? We'll see 10,000 media messages per day. You'll see 70,000 media messages before you see your pastor next Sunday. So many of them are full of lies. So I want to encourage you, develop your peace plan. It will change your life. I've had CEOs email me. I've had parents. I've had senior saints. I'm stealing that term, by the way, from Salem Salem Heights Church. I've had senior saints email me. Do you know that our senior saints, you all are a gift to this church You've been walking with the Lord. You've seen the faithfulness of God. You're like the tribe of Issachar. You are men and women who know the times. You you literally know what Israel should do. I celebrate the senior saints in this church today. You've seen the faithfulness of God, and we need your voice. We need your influence. For those of us who are younger and, you know, the sand shifts under, we think it's the end of the world. We need you speaking truth to us. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. So, Number one, I have to have a plan. Amen. (laughs) Number two, I've got to live in it. It's a discipline. It's so important. Our Jesus, my peace has to be connected to Jesus. Number three, it's a discipline. And I could, I give a whole, I, I love talking about truth, okay? Because truth doesn't change. I don't verify truth by how I'm feeling. My feelings don't validate truth. Truth is truth, whether it hurts or whether it makes me feel good. It's still truth. And so Paul loved this word truth. Um, He used it 55 times in his 13 letters. He was always coming back to truth. Jesus used it uh, in John 18, the oldest Greek fragment we have. uh, John 18, Jesus said in Greek to Pilate, ekte salatheus, those who are of the truth, hear my voice. So I have to make sure my peace plan is always locked into the truth of God's word. Don't bring me a peace plan that's unbiblical now. 
Don't bring me a peace plan of something that the Bible clearly says isn't going to bring peace in my life. Make sure it's plugged into the truth of God's word. And I want to encourage you, make it as practical as you can, and then watch your life. I, I am fascinated by this. Have you met some of these followers of Jesus? Pastor Pete and I were talking about this yesterday, and Pastor Justin too. We, we've met these individuals. They have no reason to be living in the peace of God. I mean, their life has been wrecked like the Wagners, and yet they still walk in God's peace. I love studying Christians like that. And yet, conversely, there are men and women, they have everything the world could offer. They have everything Salem could offer, and yet they have no peace. I love John 16, Jesus said, in me and in me alone is the force of the Greek. You will have peace. In the world, you're going to have tharsite. You're going to, you're going, the world is going to rip you apart. Jesus promises you that. In me, you'll have peace. Don't worry about the world. I have overcome. I and I alone. It's the Greek word nikau, Nike. That's kind of close by here, isn't it? Jesus said, I and I alone have nikau. I have overcome the world. So in me, you're going to have peace. We need to focus on the peace of God. I feel like Paul every day would wake up, and I feel like Philippians 4.8, I, I, I speculate here, but I wonder if Paul just spoke Philippians 4.8 over himself every day. 32 English words. He wouldn't have used English, of course, but Philippians 4.8, he would speak those words, finally, whatever's true, pure. I'm going to focus, Lord, on that. Because in another letter, Paul is talking about the arrows of the devil that were just hitting him constantly. Hold up the shield of faith. Speak truth to myself. It's a hard question you've asked. And you know, some of these questions, um, I'm sorry that I can't give you a social media soundbite and 120 characters are left. You, you know, some of these weighty questions, they deserve a weighty answer. And that's part of Christian thinking. My life has to be bolted to truth. My peace plan has to be bolted to truth. Um, number five, such a key for me too, when I began to really live in the peace of God, I'm going to know it because it's a totally countercultural lifestyle. Wait a minute. You don't go to athletics every single weekend of the summer? Why not, Jeremiah? You have great athletes as kids because of the peace of God in my life. And I'm not putting that down. I love that in its place. You mean, Jeremiah, you don't watch movies every single moment you can? No. And, but listen, I love taking the redhead out on a date, going to see a movie. You mean, Jeremiah, you, you take time for yourself? You do short, frequent sabbaticals like yesterday in Lincoln City? Absolutely. I believe in the peace of God. You mean, Jeremiah, you say no to some opportunities? Yeah, I say no for the bigger yes of God's peace in my life. I don't want to burn out for God. I want to be faithful to the end. And I, this one makes me thank God for pastors like Pastor Justin, faithful three decades. I met a, I met a gentleman, uh, Rob and David, in the previous service. And Dave, David brought Rob here when he was, I think, three months old. And now Rob is this big, strapping, awesome dude, growing up in the Lord in this church, faithful in season, faithful out of season. Friends, this, this will work. This will change your life if you have a peace plan, if you bolt it to truth, and then you realize it's a countercultural lifestyle to live in God's peace. What you're going to find when you begin living in the shalom of God every day, you're not as easily provoked. You do know there's an entire industry trying to provoke you out there, right? It's called clickbait. Um, I'll give you my friend Caleb Kaltenbach. I think we have that slide. He's in Costco, and he tweets this out, and he was completely joking, um, he shows a picture, Costco has Bibles for sale under the genre fiction. Now, Caleb and I were just together in November, and this was a joke. Didn't matter. The Christian rage machine started going. Let's show the next slide. A, a certain Christian provocateur wrote, a, wrote an op-ed, and go ahead and throw up the words. Um, how dare Costco? The Bible is in the fiction section. This is a slap in the face to all Christians. I think there's another, boycott Costco, Okay. I just, can I just share this with you for a moment? Maybe the person at Costco had been working a double shift and they accidentally put the Bibles, nothing intentionally, they accidentally put the Bibles in the fiction section rather than the nonfiction. It was a mistake. The CEO of Costco, who happens to be a devout Christian, came out and apologized, didn't matter. This began streaming. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think they sat in the boardroom at Costco after this and said, you know, those Christians, they're just caring, understanding people, don't you think? No. We have to be careful. I have another example I can show you. Let's go to the next slide. Um, how about Starbucks? Freaking out. This was the number one share. I don't know which year. It was 15 or 16. 
Number one shared social media post, Starbucks removed Christmas from their cups because they hate Jesus. Guess what? When you get a PhD, you can study things like this. Let's show, you could actually study the fact that Starbucks has in fact never had Christmas on their coffee cups. They've even provided gift cards that say it, but they never actually removed Christmas from their coffee cups. Now, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just making a point that when you live in the peace of God, you're not going to be so easily provoked, and you better be careful what, what hills you die on when God gives you an opportunity to preach truth. I want to preach the gospel. I'm a wreck without Jesus Christ. Jesus came. He bled and died for me. He rose from the dead for me. I believe in him, and he's changed my life. I don't want to die on the hill of Starbucks. Oops, I made a mistake. They really did. Uh, uh, uh. I lose my credibility. So am I saying that we shouldn't take a stand? Is that what you're hearing? No, I'm not saying that. I'll have someone today, and let me just, let me beat you to the punch. <laughs> well, Jeremiah, Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. Yes, he did that. I'm a gospel scholar. I, I agree with you. you. You don't have to be a gospel scholar to agree with that. Jesus did that as a sign of his messiahship, and he didn't tell anyone else to do that. Does he tell us to stand for truth? Absolutely. The Bible tells us to be ready with an answer, but with meekness and gentleness, amen? I can, by the way, I can love someone without agreeing with their lifestyle. Love doesn't equal acceptance. I don't, I mean, friends, can I just give you the Greek on it? If we just won't be a jerk today, people are going to know you're a Christian. That's how bad the world's getting. I want to live in the peace of God. I want it, I want it to exude in my life. So important. Um, I want to hasten to close. Finally, number seven, my faith is not what I feel. My faith is what I believe. Can I just say that out loud a few more times? My faith is not what I feel. My faith is what I believe. I love emotions. I ugly cry when I watch the Chosen television series. I mean, ugly cry, love it. I'm an emotional guy. I've had to learn I can't let emotions drive the car of my life. I want them in the car, but they have to strap up, put the seatbelt on, and be quiet, like I say to the triplets sometimes in the back seat. Some of us, you were on a roller coaster because we're letting feelings dictate what's truth. Well, I don't feel like a Christian today, or I don't feel like being married today, or I don't feel like my kid's crazy today. You know, all these feelings. The Bible says, my faith is not what I feel, my faith is what I believe. And can I just blow apart some bumper sticker? Please don't listen to your heart. Speak truth to your heart. Psalm 42 and 43, which was, of course, a single psalm at one time, we see the Psalter doing this. Four different times he keeps saying, gosh, why are you so depressed? Why are you disquieted? Wait, I have to preach to myself, put your hope in God, trust in God. And then, I believe it, Lord, but I don't feel it. Four times in the Psalms he had to keep preaching to his heart. Why don't you start preaching truth to your heart? I was with someone recently she turns 91 July 1st. She's led 1.2 million people to Jesus Christ, and I only know that because I asked. And she said every day she speaks promises over her life, the truth of God's word. And you know what? We have to because in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm just finishing a study on Romans right now, the Corinthians forgot the gospel. If you open up 1 Corinthians 15, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you. Why did he have to remind them of the gospel? because it's so easy to forget. Love what Jerry Bridges would say, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves every day, not just at our moment of conversion. Living in the peace of God gives us a heart for people who are marginalized. I wanna, clo I wanna close with this picture. You might wanna snap a picture of it with your phone, totally fine with me. This is a fabulous story. I used to live in the United Kingdom, and I still get the United Kingdom news. On the way over to do an event in London, uh, with Justin Brierley and John Lennox. It was a great apologetics outreach. I saw this photo and it captivated me. Because ever since people have been asking me about mental health and the peace of God, my heart has just been stirring. And I saw this great picture. And I really feel like this picture is emblematic of your series this sum summer, Our City, God's Heart, Our City. This young man in Golders Green, North London, decided to take his life by jumping off the footbridge over one of the busiest intersections in London. You know pedestrians don't have a right-of-way. 
And what happens next can only be described as a God consciousness on men and women who are walking home from work that day. They're all strangers. And we, it's hard to explain this without God because men and women see this individual who needs to be saved and they immediately co- collapse around that young man. You don't think God's sovereignly in control? I mean, I don't remember a Home Depot when I lived in England, but somebody has a rope going home from work that day, ladies and gentlemen. I, how do you explain this? Lassoed him. Someone is on their knees holding on to his calf muscles. I've got him. I won't let him go. Someone literally grabbed his belt. They are resisting him from himself. I love that gentleman on top with the brown sleeves. I can only imagine as he whispering, you're going to make it. How many of you know I have to be saved for myself some days? Salem, this city has to be saved from itself. And this is the heart of God's church when someone is struggling, when someone's having anxiety, a panic attack, depressed, lies from Satan. This is our job as believers to save people from themselves with the truth of God's word and the shalom of God. That, this picture is why I've come here. I pray that, and I want to remind you, I have to remind myself, no one ever got judged into the kingdom of God. Did you know that? They were loved. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's good at doing his job. He doesn't need our help. He will change the life. Let's bring the truth. I don't know where you are, though. When I see a picture like this, I immediately think of myself. I think of my wife. I think of my five kids. Except for God's grace, that could be me. How about you? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in this wonderful moment of just spirit-empowered reflection, Lord, we think of the Apostle Paul who saw you seven times, and yet he needed to remind himself of truth 55 times. Lord, he had to put a peace plan in place, and only then did he have that peace that passed all understanding. Lord, we need to do what Paul did. We need to rid our minds of certain things, Philippians 4, 6, and pray right now you just shine the light on those things that all of us have thought that are unbiblical, they're lies, we've embraced them. Father, we need you to shine the light on it to such an extent that we'll ignore it. We'll hold up the shield of faith and extinguish those lies, those fiery darts of the evil one. Lord, my heart goes out to anyone here today who may be religious, but they've never really trusted Christ as their savior. Couldn't possibly close this service and go home uh, without giving you the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ as your savior. If you're not for sure, if you maybe you, you're doubting, maybe you just want to know for sure, make it right right now. Don't leave this place without nailing it down. It's not these words that'll save you if you pray them. It's the faith in Christ that does. If you want to know for sure that you have peace with God through Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1 says it's an act of faith. You can do that right now by praying this prayer in your heart to God, Lord Jesus. That's right, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. And right now, by faith, I place my trust in you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins and to give me peace with God. Help me now on my new Christian walk. If you prayed that prayer, the promise of Romans 5.1 is you're forgiven. You do have peace with God, and that will never change. And yet, that's only the beginning. How many of you would say, Jeremiah, as I've been sitting here listening to you with every head bowed and every eye closed in this moment, How many of you would say, I I have an area, I have a person in my life where I need God's peace to be unleashed? Would you allow me to pray for you like someone did for me? If that's you right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of you would say, Jeremiah, pray for me. I need the peace of God unleashed in an area of my life. I want to pray for you. Just lift it up so I can see it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I need God's peace. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I need the peace of God in my life. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I need his peace unleashed on me and my family, my children. Yes, 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 ma'am. I see all these hands. Father in heaven, we're going to commit. Yes, I see these hands. Father, we're going to commit these needs to you right now. We're going to change our mind, Lord. We're going to walk out of here encouraged by the truth of your word that we can walk in the shalom, the peace of God. Father, I speak peace over every person here, the peace of Jesus. I speak the shalom of Jesus over this church. God, as a church family, in Jesus' name, we speak peace over Salem. 
Father, we ask that you would mend every broken heart with the power of the gospel. We pray that we would, Lord, be your hands, we would be your love, your presence to people who are broken. Pray, Father, that as we leave here, we'd evaluate, am I a person who brings peace or conflict? And Lord, forgive me for the times when I brought conflict instead of peace. Lord, blessed are the peacemakers. Father, we wanna just give people an opportunity. I'm not gonna close the prayer. I'm gonna ask you to, as our brother leads us in a time of worship, would you just put your own PS on the prayer time at this time? If you prayed to receive Christ, I wanna encourage you to find a pastor and share that decision with him. And brother, would you just lead us as we reflect? And we, I wanna ask you to answer and finish that prayer that we just prayed. Christ seems to hide his face. Jeremiah this morning. I think the thing that we just want you to come away with this morning is that in order for us to reach our city with the hope and peace that Christ offers, we first have to be settled in our own hearts, be at peace with God, and let that peace grow in our hearts. That's what we have to offer this city, and he has brought peace so that we can experience that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, we can give him a hand one more time. Out in the lobby, there are some books that Jeremiah has written on this topic that are helpful. He'll be out in the back if you want to meet him. Um, if you're interested in that, you be sure to check that out. But if this morning you made a profession of faith in Christ, or perhaps there's something in your life that you would love to pray with a pastor about. Uh, pastor Matt and his wife Lori will be up here. I'll be up here. Pastor Justin's here. We would love to pray with you this morning if that is you. And so don't be ashamed. Feel free to come up. For the rest of you, we're so thankful that you're here. Have a great week. We hope to see you again next Sunday. God bless.